to serve. Give us reason to live for you. Give us reason to even attend fellowship or church or do work for you. Let it be real, Lord. Let your presence be real. And we thank you. We know, Lord, that you are in charge and you are in control. We know that we are yours and you are ours. And we are happy to identify with a God. And you are happy to identify with us despite our shortcomings and our sin. And our... But you are willing to identify with us because it's you we need. And I thank you this morning that prayer would be heard in the affirmative to glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Blessed assurance Jesus is mine Over the fountains of glory divine Hero of salvation Righteous of God O Lord is me
This is our English family service. And because we are a family, I don't know how you're going to do it, but you need to take somebody's hand. I'm going to suggest that you take somebody's hand on your left and on your right, and then we sing the chorus and swing a bit. We're going to swing a bit. No, you can't be entangled like that. It's going to be very tight. Just loosen up a bit. Sing. to pray for your neighbor now every blessing in heaven become theirs would you like to pray for them father we thank you for we are a family and we now release our brothers and sisters our friends and neighbors we pray lord that every blessing named in heaven will be theirs that they will receive it this morning that every hidden desire Every desire of their heart, every expectation of heaven will be provided, and that we will see the glory of God, and that we shall receive from you from the bounty of heaven every blessing that you give, and that this will be to your glory, Father. Heal somebody, touch somebody, deliver somebody, set free somebody, give them joy, give them happiness. In Jesus' name. And everyone shouted, Hallelujah. Okay, now listen. I noticed from Paul that he was praying for his wife. You people, please do that at home. We're going now to find somebody else that we are not connected to. Find somebody else. Even Maina was praying for his wife. It's not fair. It's not fair. Don't pray for your partner or your wife. Or, no, find somebody. Bless somebody else. Come on, turn around. Lord, we thank you. In the name of Jesus. And we pray for each other. That the blessings of heaven will be ours. And that you'll move by your power and by your spirit. And cause us. In the name of Jesus cause us to receive from you so that the name of Jesus may be glorified lift that voice lift that voice please thank you Lord touch heal deliver encourage release and bless And let the name of Jesus be glorified. In Jesus' name, and everyone shouted. That's much better. That's a lot better. Anyone has a story? Jesus is your Savior. Let's give the Lord the praise. And I don't know whether this service anyone brought their um, trumpets and chauffeurs and vuvuzelas. Let us do one minute 
of that if you have it if you don't you're going to have to clap and shout and make noise as god can allow you come on let's go seated this is the final week of our prayer and fasting and it's the final week of the shofar we're going to be breaking the fast this coming sunday um on sunday morning when you come you may break your fast then or you can break in the evening it's up to you you can take a decision we're, we've already done um, more than we promised ourselves. Sunday next, we will burn all the um, Passover cards and we'll trust God to enter into a new area where God answers every prayer and gives us the desire of our hearts. Can somebody say amen? amen. A couple of weeks ago, I, 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 I thought of something that I believe um, is meaningful. I was uh, visited by a gentleman and his family. They had come to meet me and pray, basically. People come to pray. So they came to ask for prayer. And they insisted that I get to meet one of their family. So I said, fine. I made an appointment and they came. Unbeknown to me, they just arrived at the office and sat at the reception and then I ushered them in, and one of them had lost both legs. He was involved in a border border accident, and it became imperative that he be amputated. To amputate is to cut off people's limbs, like legs or hands. But this man did not have both his hands. And he had photos of scores, literally dozens, different dozens of people in different wards in um, the hospital. And he told me the story of how people are really losing their limbs very, very fast because of the recklessness of the border border riders. And somehow, I started thinking, how do I help this man? How? Well, the prayer was about him starting a business that he can do seated. That was the prayer. The prayer concern was, we need to find something for, he needs to find, he needs to come up with an idea of what he can do seated. Because he used to 
be a rider. But now he's going to be, he's going to be confined to some location for, for almost forever. For until he goes to see Jesus. And I thought, this is not fair. Anyway, we prayed. We started brainstorming. And I thought that if he can stand up in any way, if he can raise himself up and be able to stand, maybe he can even keep a shop, can be like a shopkeeper. Slow movement, yes, but he, he'll be mobile. He'll be able to do something. That's where the idea started. So I have set aside a campaign to collect all your coins silver copper and any which way if you have any coins ugandan coins the 500 the 1000 there are coins that are 1000 shillings i don't want notes i want coins i want coins for change i want to raise some little money and buy a few people some some kind of thing to work with. We've ever done it to somebody, so it is doable. I don't know how much it costs nowadays. I've not been very inquisitive about it. But I would like to begin to say that between now and December 31st, it is possible we could help one, two, three, four, five persons and give them limbs to work with. It's possible. All you do is whenever you have change in coins, walk with it up to here. We'll set aside a small basket and we can collect the coins by the day, whenever you come. If you, have, if you ever come here during the day and you don't have, um, there's no service, you can still bring it up. Um, my, my office attendant, my secretary, my uh, administrators are there. They'll take care of that. The first time I mentioned it was Wednesday. And a lady heard me from Mukono. And she said, I have some coins, but they are very heavy. Please come and pick them. And the following day, I think two days later, we sent somebody to pick the coins. And we counted 130,000. 130,000 shillings in coins. Now, you need people like that times 10 to create a million shillings. I don't know how many millions we need because if the limbs are cut, if, you, if, you, if you're cut below the knee, it's a different price. If it is above the knee, it'll be a totally different price, depending on how that helps your mobility. But the point I'm making is we can make one or two or three persons walk just with coins. So coins for change. Bring all your coins. How many of you have a few coins in your houses? If you have some, and you know they are there. Yeah. Especially you bankers, you have a lot of them because you don't use them. I know some of you are very rich. You are super rich. You have all your money is in notes and cards and other things. Some of your money is in your head. That's okay. But for the coins, when you go to a supermarket, you are given coins as change. Keep that money. Bring it to me every Sunday and every other day of the week when you come for service. We will use it carefully. We'll make sure. A lady heard me from Kawempe and said he's going to need a box. He's going to need a box to keep that money. She created a box for me. She brought it. A little box. Not big. But I think by the end of the year we'll have a box. We'll need a box as big as that. Or possibly even as big as the other. Who cares? Or oh, we'll need five of them. All I want is your change. The coins that you live around and never get to use them. Because many people, when they get coins and bring them home, they never take them back to, to shopping. It takes a lot of effort for somebody to pick up coins. Especially you. This service. You always pick up notes. Because they are easy to carry. But notes are heavy. 10,000 shillings, you can't hold it like so. So that's what I'm looking for. 
Will you do it? Will you do it? Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want to go to Jinja with us, please make sure that the office is um, aware that you want to go. Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to be very brief today. God helping me. Matthew 11, chapter 11, verse 12. Matthew? 11, 12. Chapter 11 and verse 12. Yes. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. Okay. Jesus spoke this scripture in the midst of many. He was speaking in defense of his ministry and the ministry of his predecessor, John the Baptist. Actually, in verse 11, it talks about the greatness of John, where he says, read it, verse 11, Assuredly, I said to you, Assuredly, I say to you, yes. among those born of women, yes. there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. What Jesus is actually saying here is that there has never been a human being, a prophet of any sort, that came before him that was greater than John the Baptist. So John was actually greater than Moses and Elijah and all of them big boys. That's a big statement. That means at one time somebody needs to sit down and study why Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest among all prophets before him. We need to do a study, but that's not where I'm here. What I'm here for is to wake you up as we enter the final phase of our prayer time before God and enter into the next part of the year where we expect to now begin to harvest from our faith, from our prayer, the harvest of receiving that which you've been praying for. We need to understand how to work in this kingdom. A very simple principle here is that the violent take kingdom stuff by violence. It's going to take violence. I don't care which forms you are thinking about. It takes defiance to do anything in this country. It takes defiance to the kingdom of the enemy, the devil, Satan. It will take a very powerful opposing force coming out of you Standing against the devil and his wiles, the devil and his plans, the devil and his suggestions to be able to do anything on earth. If you are lazy, if you weaken yourself, if you consider yourself a weak-minded person, the devil will rule over you and you'll have nothing. But God has not called us to be ruled. God has called us as a kingdom of priests. Oh, come on. First Peter, quickly. God has called us as a kingdom. First Peter. First Peter. Chapter 2. Chapter 2. Verse 9. And verse 9. Yes. But you are a but chosen you, generation. Talking about you and I. You, if you could circle in your Bible about that you and say, Sarada, put Sarada there. Since you don't have a name and you have, you have no identity, put me there. But you, Sarada, are, a chosen, are a chosen generation. That you is plural. It's a second person pronoun, but in plural. It's not a, sing, a singular thing. It is a compound pronoun. It, it, it includes all of us. You are a chosen generation. A royal priesthood. Yes. A holy nation. Yes. His own special people. His own special people. 
that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who were once not a people? Read. Who? Who once were not a people, but, but are now the people of God, Yes. who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, when we talk about violence, we don't mean, you, we don't mean that you need to pick up a panga or a knife or a gun or anything stupid to go to kill people. It's violence in the spirit. It's doing things with the attitude that it has to be done. First and foremost, it has to be done. What needs to be done will have to be done. Let's start with that as an idea. What needs to be done will have to be done. Now, in this kingdom, here is a principle to walk by, to go by. If everyone will do everything, nobody will do anything. Have you ever heard of that? Let me say it again so that you can write it down. If everyone will do everything, then nobody will do anything. What that means is, you cannot expect your neighbor to be the one that does what you're supposed to do. God has dealt with each one of us a measure of faith. I repeat that because it is in scripture. If you want, I can find the scripture. They can find it for you. God has dealt with each one of us a measure of faith. In other words, when God wired you, he made you special for a special purpose. That's why you don't look like your neighbor. You have the same features. Eyes, nose, eyes, lips, and blah, 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 whatever, everything else. But really, if you look at us, all of us, we are all totally different. Each one of us is a unique individual. And you are wired to do some things. And no one is going to do your job. No one is going to fulfill your chores. C-H-O-R-E-S. Your chores. Long time ago when I used to be a little boy, I would be given some chores by mommy. Like, I had to wash dishes. Dishes are not supposed to be washed by women only. So I had to wash dishes. Ukoze sowani. So... That was my chore. Now, if you are given an assignment to wash dishes, you are going to have to wash dishes. Simple. There's no discussion. But if there's going to be one, not with my mother. That's why you don't hear very much of her from me. Because for me, she was this military woman that only wears a gomesi. All I heard from her were orders, 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 day, morning, evening, everywhere, orders. So, you're going to wash dishes. That's your chore. Honey, it's the same with God. There are things that God expects you personally to do. And you are not going to pass them over to somebody else. I hope you catch this. You are not going to transfer your responsibility and pass on your responsibility to somebody else. Your husband has an assignment. Your wife has an assignment. The children have an assignment. Every one of us has a duty. Now, in the scripture we read, Matthew chapter 11 verse 12, it says, from the days of John up to our times now, the kingdom of God suffers violence. You can interpret it both ways and it will still be right. The word suffer in the old English, the King James Old English, the old usage to suffer was to allow. Jesus said, suffer the little children to come to me because theirs is the kingdom of God. Suffering was permission. The kingdom of God allows for violence. It accepts violence. 
God allows you to be violent if whatever you are doing is for his kingdom. Right. In the new in the in, in the understanding of the new English, when you use the word suffer, it means to cause pain. Still you're right. The kingdom of God is not going to come on a silver plate. The kingdom of God is going to demand a bit of pain. You've got to push it to get something out of it. Now, you, you cannot just sit here and expect things to happen. There's nothing going to happen for you when you are seated. Except if you tell me that by sitting, you are now taking the kingdom violently. If your style is sitting, that's okay. If God has led you to sit down so that the kingdom of God is taken that way, perfect. I know very few people who sit down and make things happen. So the kingdom of God must be approached with a little bit of energy. Let's start. Let's put the king violence into simpler words. For example, the word energy. You know from the foundations of the Bible that you're not going to pray and say, God, because it is your will, let this happen. The devil will look at you and mock you and even smile at his demons and say, look at this little bastard. He will call you any name. The devil will call you any name because he knows. You don't get anything like that. The kingdom of the devil has to be attacked. Why? The kingdom of the devil is the kingdom of death. You don't face death with ease. You approach the kingdom of the enemy with vigor. So here goes another word. Violence, energy, vigor. If you're going to take anything from the devil, you're going to use a little bit of enthusiasm. Another word is excitement. It's going to be noisy. That's what he's saying. Now if you read the Old Testament, I don't know about the New Testament in terms of war, but if you read the Old Testament, Everything you see in the Old Testament seems to revolve and go around war. I don't know. The father of the faith, Mr. Abraham, Uncle Abraham, Prophet Abraham, Jaja Ibrahim, was a fighter. Yeah. He had 318 soldiers on standby to protect his property. It's on record. This man had soldiers. If you have soldiers, you have swords. If you have soldiers, you have weapons. So, you only protect your property with arms. Amre. Abraham had an Amra, a store for ammunition to protect his property, his interests, his family. And the Bible says the robbers one day went and attacked his cousin, Lot, in Sodom, and they took everything. And it was told of Abraham that your brother was taken and all the stuff that he has and everything has been taken captive. And he raided that camp to rescue his cousin. He used arms. If Abraham was a fighter, you are not going to be less. You carry the same DNA with Abraham. He was a fighter, you got to be one. Can you tell that to your neighbor and say, Abraham, Jaja Abraham, 
was a fighter. So it just follows naturally. You are going to be a fighter. You should have been already a fighter. What will you get for free? It will take life or death to save humanity. Jesus died for you to save you. Did you hear what I said? I said what? Jesus did what? Now, if you think death is easy, try once. Just try once. Try dying once. And let it happen. You die and see how hard it is. Some, somebody is saying, how will you know? Oh yes, you will know you died. You will know. On the other side, they'll tell you, don't, don't try anything. You died. In the Bible days, there were always spoils of war to be gained after somebody died. I need to tell you right now so that I don't get to forget that when Abraham fought that battle with three kings and one over them, he took a tithe. That's when the first tithe was given. And he took a tithe from the spoils and gave it to Melchizedek. Out of this young man's property which they had stolen, the man had no insurance over his property. That's why it was stolen. That's for you to think about. Abraham did not take, take, take the first tithe out of his own property. He took it out of the spoil that he had taken from these kings that had taken his uh, cousin brother's property. And he said, you stupid fool, you don't know how to protect your property. First of all, you don't have any fighters to protect it. Secondly, you don't even have insurance. You need to give your tithe over your property. So he took a tithe and gave it to, to Melchizedek, the king, the, the prophet in Salem, the, 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 the priest, and the prayer was made. Nobody comes to attack this man again. The first time you see fighting, you'll see it in Abraham. He's always there. Violence. Let me think quickly and take you where I want to go. Isaiah 53 verse 12. Isaiah 53 verse 12. Quickly. Isaiah 53 verse 12. What does it say? Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. Yes. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. Because Jesus poured out his soul. This is a prophetic, a prophetic chapter. Isaiah 53. It's a, it's a chapter that discusses what Jesus did for us. He was beaten for our iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. Um, it is by his stripes that were healed. And there is a very strange scripture. Verse 12 which says... Therefore, Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. Yes. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he has numbered with the transgressors. And now listen to me. What I wanted to say is very easy. It's in the second line of that scripture. It says, he will share spoil with the strong. He shall divide the spoil with the strong. In other words, weaklings are never allowed to, to share in a spoil. If you don't go to fight, you have no right to claim any of the spoil. That's what it simply means. Interesting that God says that concerning Jesus because when Jesus gave up his life for us he became a strong man so whatever is given as glory do you realize that whatever is given as glory to God God says I'll give part of that to him who gave his life in other words when you worship God in the name of Jesus there's no mistake because God allowed this man who was strong, who was strong-willed 
in his character enough to die for us. And God says he can take some of the glory. That's why he was given a name. The name that is above all other names. So that at his name, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that what? That Jesus is what? To the glory of God. We forget that. We don't stop at Jesus is Lord. It says, he, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. When you hear people pray in the name of Jesus, it's a very serious thing. It's an acquired authority. We are praying through a name that is not an imposition. We are praying through a name that has been given that authority over what we are praying for. Everything you want is in that name because that name earned its position in the Godhead. Can, can I hear amen? amen? So, the simple thought here is there will not be any sharing of the spoil if you are weak. Tell that to your neighbor. Say, there will be no sharing of the spoil if you are what? The weak do not share in the spoils of life. Victory in spiritual warfare is what qualifies a man for sharing the spoils. Victory. You remember David going out to fight. First Samuel chapter 30, you know the story where he says, Everybody should get a spoil. Part of the spoil. Yeah. It is people that share the spoils of life that take their place among the great in life. Those who cannot share in the spoils of life remain small. You can pass through this planet and remain insignificant. Remain small, tiny, insignificant, never remembered, nobody bothers. You die Actually, what we should write on your grave when you have done nothing is he was, he died, he went. Because we don't know what to write about you. The angel said to the, to, 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 to the people who came to the graveside where Jesus had laid, they said, he's not here. He's risen. That was the writing. He's not here. He's risen. What will they write on yours? He was. He's no more. Oh, he was born. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He did a lot of work being born. He was born. He lived. He died. We don't know where he is now. That's why I'm advocating now that we find certain areas where we can be violent and take the kingdom of God by violence. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Oh yeah. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Daniel chapter 11, 32. And verse 32. Those. Those who do wickedly against the covenant. They shall corrupt. They shall corrupt with flattery. But. But the people who know their God. Yes. Shall be strong. Uh -huh. And carry out great exploits. So exploits. Great exploits. Are a preserve of the strong. Those who know their God. Shall be strong. And shall do exploits. Daniel 11.32 Exploits are never for the weak. Weak-minded, weak-willed. Me, I'm not a fighter. Uh, uh, me, I'm, uh, I don't even know the adjective to use. I don't know what you define yourself as. Me, I am uh, a simple person. Me. me, I am. You always find some little thing to excuse yourself with. 
That's not allowable in the kingdom. The Bible says the people who know are so. Your first strength is in knowledge. Come on, you are not going to excuse yourself. It won't be allowed. This scripture. Let's put the scripture on the screen again. But the people, this is the second part of the scripture. But the people who know their God, don't remove that scripture. It is knowledge that distinguishes people. Knowledge is what makes you different from your neighbor. What you know and others don't know is what you have ahead of them. You have... When you know something that somebody else does not know, you have advantage over them. The advantage over others starts with knowledge. What do you know that your neighbor does not know? Your neighbor does not know the cost of that dress in Dubai. Your neighbor does not know the cost of that car in Japan. So if you bring it here, you can give it a price and they will be happy. Your neighbor does not know that you have a power to negotiate your taxes. The difference between traders and how people make money is how they mitigate those charges. Your neighbor does not know. If they don't know, you have already won over them. You can name your price. How did David beat Goliath? Goliath always, always had this mind that there was at least three weapons of mass destruction. A sword, a knife, and a javelin. And that's what he brought to the, to, to, to the battle. But this little young man knew that you can hit something from far with a good stone. All you need is a good butida. Goliath is dead. Because he thought everybody was going to fight a conventional war. Everyone comes with a sword, then they go chop, chop, chop. And this man says, I can't get near this thing. It's an animal. I can't. I'm not allowed to get near. Just picks up one of the stones and goes, shui, shui, shui. What happens? It's down. You're gone. Not every weapon that everyone has is the one that is supposed to fight. All you need to know is what advantage do I have over these people? Number one advantage is knowledge. Have you heard of what they call the Pareto principle? I've said it a thousand times. I'm going to say it again. Pareto. P-A-R-E-T-O. Have you heard of it? How many of you have heard of it? A few. How many of you have never heard of Pareto? Pareto was an Italian guy, a philosopher. His principle is, the principle is, 20% of the population rules the 80%. Ho, ho, ho. Did you hear what I said? Pareto believes that 20% of the Population, yes. It did. 20% in any given nation. How many people are in Uganda? 40 what? 40 what? 40 or 45? 45. 20% 40 of 45 is 9 million. There are 9 million people in this country... That if you expunge them and suspend them somewhere, and then you kill the whole lot, the leftover material, you kill them, you go, psh, 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 and they are dead. And then you bring back the other nine million. Uganda is still here. Because it is the 20% that think 
plan and move the nation. Pareto. All the wealth in a nation is not in the hands of the majority. It is always in the 20%. All the wealth of Uganda, you hear of gold, platinum, you hear of oil, uh, mafuta, you hear of things in Karamoja, in Mbubende, you hear of coffee, you hear of everything you are hearing. This budget you just had read is not the business of the majority. It's the business of 20%. It's the 20% telling you what they are going to do for you. Whether you want it or not, they've already set the standards. They are the standard setters. They are the pace setters. So what is your job? You need to walk away from the 80% and join the 20%. And there is no room. You just have to squeeze yourself in there. Now they never open the door. Never. It's always 20%. Either somebody there dies and you take their space, or you find a means of saying, I'm here also. If the door is closing on you, it closes on you, but you are inside. If you are not in the 20%, then you are in the 80 In the 80 your voice doesn't matter, your noise doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you'll be considered an ikom pump, a fool. Because you are not part of the decision-making machinery. You are not a decision-maker. Violence teaches you to be part of leadership. Violence teaches you to be, to be part of decision-making. If they sit together and decide, why don't we print some more notes? They don't even consult you. They will just go print. Your noise, of course, will be like, oh, we need, we need our mafuta to be reduced at least to what? To 5,000. But who said the 5,000? It is still their price that you are playing with. That's what I'm talking about today. You've got to be strong in your will and be part of what happens in society. The good thing is that God supports it. So once you start your journey, God will find a way of getting you in there. Or somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> knowledge. Knowledge. Totally, totally different. Have you ever seen somebody who has never seen a gun? When we were starting to build this structure, in that re little corner there, that, that sharp, sharp corner on the other side, there was a big, massive tree. Really big tree. And there were shrubs around it. It was like a forest, a kasaka. And there were four brand new AK-47 guns in there. So as we started to dig the foundation, we saw the guns. Then we had no idea. And when we saw the we said, hey, 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 guns, whoa, 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 somebody help, please. So I sent, young, I sent young people, I said, go to the police station. They went to the police station. The police came here uh, and, you know, and they picked up the four guns. And they took them. Up to now, I wish to God it happened today. Because they will never get those guns. No. Then I knew nothing. Now I know something. If I have four guns, hey, hey. <laughs> there were four guns in that corner. We, Called for the police. I think Uncle Paul was there. Called for the police. They came here. They did some little bit of uh, jogging and they prayed. And when they started praying with the guns themselves to see whether they were real guns or functional, we all went, hey, hey, Because ignorance, have you heard of the expression, ignorance is bliss? Yeah, if somebody does not know anything, it kills them very quietly and very nicely. They never know. They did. They don't get to know they died. They just found out, find out later that they died. The people who know their God will do what? Shall be strong. Strong is not about muscle. We are not talking about muscle now. We are talking brains. 
We are talking reasoning capacity. We are talking things that make for life. Everything is not made up of muscle. If it was muscle, every one of us has muscles. I mean, if we all added all our muscles here, what can't we push? And you know the people who have muscle? They are wheelbarrow pushers. Yeah. Either they are boxers or weightlifters or wheelbarrow pushers. That's it. Where do you use muscle? Where? When does muscle work? No, no. You have made so much noise over the last two weeks. And what have you said? If you raise the salary of science, science teachers, we also, ours has to be risen. Has it been risen? Is it raised again? Not yet. Because they are still thinking. So, walk away. Thank you. Walk away from muscle. Go to the brain. Go back to school. If you're going to study, go and study science. Somebody says, uh oh, yeah, you know. You know why? Because this science now rules. It's a trend of time and day. Why are we discussing it? Because we see a lot of it, a lot of stuff in it. The good thing, the only thing that I feel happy about, and I'm happy, thank you. I'm even getting money. See what brains do? You get money without asking. Now listen, people. The reason why I'm still happy that I started arts, because I'm not a scientist. I am an artist. I started arts. I, when I went to school, that's what I could manage. History, geography, English, literature, that's what I studied. That's what I know. At a later stage, mass media, law, that's what I studied. And the only reason I studied those is because I could use it. I, didn't, I don't know how I can use science. Now I can use science. Now I can. Now I know I can. I can go and teach. But then I didn't even have any better idea. The reason why I went to law school was because I was tired of people telling me what to do and quoting some stupid things in a book that I've never read, so I, I want to study it. The good thing about art students is we think. Science is prefixed. If there is a planet going around, it has been going around for ages. You, you think nothing. What are you going to think? But if you take me to court, I want to understand what is happening. I want to study the demeanor of the judge and all the people around it. Then I will know how to jump over this case. That's the good thing about arts. You at least use your brain. So go back to Pareto. Think. Let's think. How can we now win this battle? The people who know their God shall be strong. Be strong. In your mind, be strong in your character. Be strong in your character. Be reliable. If you say something, do it. If you promise anything, that's what you do. If you speak to a woman and say, I love you, you're going to be my friend forever, stick to your guns, honey. Don't jump from one decision to another. Be strong in your will. When you decide to do something, do it. There's nothing wrong with fulfilling a dream. Do it. There is nothing wrong with looking at something and saying, that's a good thing. I want a copy. Take it. Go build something better. Learn from others. Be strong-willed. Let everyone know that when you decide to do something, you are a stickler. You'll never move. Be movable. That is strength. Refuse to be intimidated. Refuse. Just refuse. 
Refuse to be intimidated by anybody. By any system. Learn and walk around it. Fight until you get there. They shall be strong. They will also do exploits. Exploits are things that are not common to regular human beings. Things that are not common to regular human beings. Everyone can be a common, regular human being. You are not common. You are not regular. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are a peculiar people. A holy nation. A specialized group of people. Did you know that Christians are a nation within nations? You didn't hear that, did you? We are the only people that hold dual citizenship. And we don't break any law. We are citizens, citizens of heaven. And we are also citizens of Uganda. Amen. But do you know that? Are you sure you are a citizen of heaven? Because that's what is most important. If you are a citizen of heaven, heaven will support you. You are an ambassador of a kingdom. Be strong. And be in that power of his might. Let me close this because my time is used up now. A few minutes and I'll sit down. So where is your candle? Where is your zeal? Where is your eagerness? Where is your determination? These are words used to, to tell people who we are. Okay. Where should we apply this violence? Number one, be violent in prayer. Let prayer come out of your heart. You don't need to pray a million hours of prayer to get an answer. Jesus said to his disciples, could you not tarry with me one hour? If you are able to handle one hour a day, enough. I teach people, and I'm going to teach you now, start with one hour a year. Then graduate to one hour a month. Then keep graduating to one hour a week. Then come to one hour a day. The moment you begin to pray for one hour each day, you are a success story. I, I don't know how to pray. No, 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 no. If you don't know how to pray, I agree with you. Do you have needs? Yes, how many are they? Pray until those 20 needs become 15. Then 10. Then 5. Pray until you have only one need. And you can look back and say, I prayed for that, I prayed for that, I prayed for that. All of those are answered prayers. Now what I want is this. Come on people. Learn to pray with violence. Oh dear. The Bible says the persistent and heartfelt prayer of a righteous man, James chapter 5 verse 16. Persistent, this is in the Amplified. Those who have the Amplified, but read James 5 16. The persistent. James 5 16. Read, read. James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. Mm. Confess your trespasses to one another. Yes. And pray for one another. Read. That you may be healed. Yes. The effective. The effective. Fervent prayer. Fervent prayer. Of a righteous man. Of a righteous man. Avails much. Avails very much. You, you can't pray a common prayer. Many years ago, before I got saved, we used to have prayer points sent from Rome. All I prayed was what the Pope wanted. Until I found out, 
many years after I got saved, that I also had needs. So the people in Venezuela, the people in Cambodia, they have their needs. But who is praying for people in Uganda? The people in Somalia uh, and the people in, in Eritrea, they have needs. That's okay. What about me? You think about it. Somebody said to me, when are you going to go to um, some, some funny land near Eritrea? I'm, I'm trying to think. Not Somalia. No, Ethiopia. There was an issue in Ethiopia. And he said, when are you going to Ethiopia to preach? I said, no, no, no. Does, hasn't Ethiopia produced any preachers? Let the Ethiopians preach. To themselves. I'm preaching to Ugandans. I have enough trouble. I have enough trouble. I repeat. I have enough trouble getting Ugandans to preach to themselves and pray for themselves. And then you are sending me to Eritrea. Let Eritrea raise its own pastors and preachers. There, there is a lot of dying in Rwanda and Congo. Okay, but doesn't Rwanda have any preachers? Let them pray. We are also praying. The fervent prayer of a righteous man avails very much. Am I making sense to anyone? So you cannot wait for prayer from somebody for you. This is the truth. Nobody wants to preach it to you, but I will, because I'm your friend. If you tell me to pray for you, I'll pray for you five minutes, but you be rest assured, the 55 minutes left on the hour is mine, because I expect you to also pray for me for five. I mean, some of you don't even pray for me. But we, hey, pastor, how do you prefer? Pastor Boba Achimara. So if you are going to give me five minutes of your time, I'm also going to give you five. The expectation is the 55, you are handling it well. So you don't pray for us. I do. Five minutes. Jesus, you don't even pray for me for half an hour. And what do you want to do with the other half? If I give you half an hour of my time, hey, who will take care of my time? Who will pray for me? Have you heard of the expression, higher devils or higher levels? Higher devils. Where I am, I need more prayer than an hour. So, do me a favor. Do 55 and leave me small room to pray for you, to just seal it. Thank you, Lord, for blessing Aunt Molly. Thank you, Lord, for blessing my sister. Thank you, Lord. It is thank you, Lord, for answering her prayer. Actually, that's what I'm saying. Thank you, Lord, for answering her, which I believe she has done for 55 minutes. Anybody who tells you, it's okay. It's a good statement. But have you ever wondered how much prayer we do for each one of you in a service? If every one of you was to take some fraction in terms of time, in terms of minutes or seconds of the prayer we do in church, how much would you take home? You think, I stand here and I say, Father, in the name of Jesus, everyone who came to church today, bless them, touch them, encourage them, give them whatever they need, and your name may be glorified in, in Jesus' name. And you say, Amen. Okay. Ha, he prayed for us. How much time did I pray for you? Is a question. Milliseconds. Milliseconds. I didn't even pray for a minute for you because my prayer was communal. My prayer was like a blanket. So what am I doing? What am I saying? I am saying you learn to pray violently for yourself. Do you know a man who prayed violently? His name is Jacob. Gets a chance. An angel visits with him. Is coming out of a place he had been for 20 some years as a refugee. Decides to come back home with his wife and children. 
and he begins to think there's going to be a fight between me and my brother. So he decides he's going to fight. And he says, let me pray first. He prays. And an angel showed up. And Jacob gets a hold of him and says, who are you? Well, and I'm an angel from God. He says, you are an angel? From God? Yeah. <laughs> I am not going to let you go until you have blessed me. Who is he praying for? Everybody answer that question. Who is he praying for? When you come to a point where you are desperate and God shows up, it is not time to discuss other people. It is time to discuss your issues yourself. And you know, every one of us gets that opportunity. God visits. Do you know how many times God came to individuals and says, what can I do for you? Jesus said to the blind man, excuse me, sir, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine Bartimaeus, the blind man, starting a story and saying, Jesus, you know my family? No, 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 we're talking about you now. What can I do for you? Yeah, I'm also telling you, uh, my village... And people want the gospel to be complicated. Jesus says, what can I do for you? The man says, Lord, I want to see. And Jesus said, see. Done. How many years had it been? Many years. How much did it take for him to see? One instant prayer. Lord, that I may see. Not even a whole sentence. Lord, let me see. And Jesus said, See, he didn't even use two words for him to see. Every one of you must get that opportunity to be in touch with God. A one-on-one. -on -one. And hear God say, what do you want me to do for you? And the answer, this. Do you have, do you have a prayer? that nobody knows about, that only you can express? I don't think so. Are you violent enough to take it? You must come to a point where what you want has become part of your life that even if you are dreaming, that's what you dream. If you heard me tell your neighbor what I just said, your prayer, your need must become part of your life so much so that even if God visited you in a dream, you would still say, that's what I want. Do you remember the Bible saying that God visited Solomon in the night and said to him, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon says, give me what? Oh, God says, come on, listen, 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 listen. I can give you enemies. I can give you a lot of wealth. I can give you long age. This is God speaking to a man in a dream. I can give you long life. I can also give you a lot of stuff. You can be very rich. And the man said, no. You give me wisdom, and you'll have sorted out all of those ones. This was God personal encounter with God. Violence only happens when you have a personal encounter with God. In prayer, when you pray, God will give you the desire of, not your neighbor's heart, but the desire of. So, from now on, I expect each one of you to begin to pray violently. We tell people, begin to pray, and people go, Jesus Christ. Jesus, Jesus, and I'm not saying, Jesus, don't Jesus, Jesus me. I said pray. We are talking about your life. We are talking about your future. We are talking about your destiny. We are talking about where you are going. You are jobless. You are homeless. You don't have a friend. You don't have a partner. You are not married. You, 
You are not even single. You are single and a single mother. You have a lot of need. And we say, okay, everyone please begin to pray. And you go, oh, Jesus. And then you see somebody going, yes, you do this. and you say, eh. how much trouble does this one have? <laughs> Number two, pray. After you pray, then praise. Violence in praise brings God down. The Bible says God inhabits the what? The praises of his people. You must praise God so loud, so powerful that God comes down and says, I want to see what these guys are talking about. When God comes down, everything changes. <laughs> praise. When David hit Goliath and killed him and became a star overnight, one day only, he became the star of town. And the women began to, 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 to sing about him. The Bible says David started. Before you know, he's dancing. Before you know, he's sweating. Before everybody is aware, the clothes are dropping off. He doesn't care. And his newly wedded wife looks and says, oh my God, once a villager, forever one. Look at this man. How do you dance like that? He does not know that is now loyalty. So he comes to talk to, uh, she comes, sorry. She comes to talk to, 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 the, to, to the prince. There are princes who don't know how to be. Do you know what you did today? What did I do? Did you see how you danced? No. You've not seen the video? No, it's gone viral. Really? Yeah. What happened? Oh, come on. You even lost some of your clothing. How do you do that? You are married to me. I am Saul's daughter. I am a princess, for God's sake. I want to. And the princess wants to die. And David said, you can die a thousand times for all I care. I really don't care. If you are not died, you can die. Why? You don't know how I came to be. I was dancing for the one that made me. <laughs> Praise must be violent. We say to people, sing for him. And you want some of these songs that are very, very classy, classic, you know. Blessed assured. Jesus. Even your Jesus is not fully pronounced. You know, Jesus is mad. No. You need to come to a point where if you're dancing, dance. About three weeks ago, or four weeks ago, I think, I suddenly found out that four years ago, I bought a suit, and I had never worn it. A brand new suit it was there in the closet. So I was going through, and I said, I've never worn this. So I put it on. I came here. The choir started singing. I got excited, and I picked up my jacket, turned and, 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 and turned and, and pushed uh, and tied it around me and I, started, and I started dancing and the dance went viral and I said why is this going why, why, why is everybody sharing this because they've never seen a pastor dance really we need to dance every day so that it becomes normal violence the last I think second last the last part that we need to, we need to be violent with our giving Violent givers are violent receivers. People are poor because God gives back what we give. I will not discuss that because you will not, you will not like it. 
violence in evangelism. We need to be a church that goes out. Not a church that sits here. I honestly must tell you that I don't have that capacity. I don't have that capacity to sit in a chair and wait until the souls come to me. I don't have that capacity. I'm not a waiter. I don't. I am a go-getter. I want to go out there where the sinners are, preach to them and get them into church. Even if they don't come to Ndeva, I don't care. If they get saved and go to any church in the neighborhood, praise God. Because they've not gone to a shrine. They are not in a sabo. They went to church. It pays dividends. Years later, you'll find it. Let us be violent in evangelism. Let's go and preach the gospel. How do you spend your Saturdays and Sundays? Go out. After church service here, you've been blessed. Go home, have a shower, eat dinner. Then after that, three o'clock to five o'clock, go to the streets. Don't do very much except shout. Jesus loves you. Hello, Jesus loves you people. If you can afford it, wear very well. Have a nice suit on. Jesus loves you. They look at you and say, I know this man. I know this woman. I know he works for... I know him. I know him. He's a... What did he say? Jesus loves you. Is he preaching? Yeah. Really? Maybe. When you do it five times, you'll get bolder and bolder and bolder. And before you know, you have a crowd. And before you know, they are getting saved. And before you know, you have a true fellowship in your house. Reach out to people near you. Your workmates. Today there is something called street evangelism. And there is also something else called marketplace evangelism. Marketplace evangelism is when you minister or you reach out to people your caliber, your type, your fashion, your style. Bankers to bankers. Lawyers to lawyers. Broadcasters to broadcasters. You talk to each other. It's a language they all understand. You can start very cheaply and say, I want to pray for us today. You know, I'm not the pastor. I have a pastor somewhere. But I want us to pray. I, I believe that this thing needs to be turned into a prayer. Father, bless each one of us. Give us your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. The people who have never prayed will hear you pray. And they marvel. Evangelism has started. You'll get bolder. Your prayers will get longer. They'll be to the point. Slowly and slowly, you'll have a niche in that company. And they will know who you are. And they will never play games with you again. And you know how God works. When you start that, God starts from this other side. Promotion for you. Money comes your way. Better things come. Gratuities come, fortunes come, and before you know, they are saying, this man is getting better. I want to have what he has. Evangelism started with a simple prayer. It has become violent. You are now the leader of every prayer group, every prayer thing in that company. Before you leave, you'll be the champion of that company. Who knows? God may even give you the same company. You own it instead of just working with it. You begin to own it. You can buy it off them. What else would you be praying for? If I worked for MTN, I'll take it. I'll take it. I went to CBS many years ago as a priest, as, as, as what do you call them? People who come to programs. What do you call people who come to programs in a, a studio? Is somebody guests. I used to be a guest in a program at CBS and every time I, I sat there, I kept saying, I need this. God, if you don't give me this, give me something else equal to this. 
That's how I, I got into media. Actual media. Forget studying. I sat in a studio and started praying. I would sit there, be a guest, but pray. Until I got it. You are in a company and you are not thinking of taking it? What are you doing there? Take it. The violent, take it by force. Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you. We cannot be part of government and not take it. We cannot be part of decision making and not take those realms up to us. Teach us to be violent in prayer, in praise, in Christian living, in character, in evangelism, in giving. Lord, teach us to do your will. Teach us to manifest your glory. Teach us to show your power. Teach us to influence society. Teach us to be part of that which makes for the future. Teach us to be leaders and to lead others into your desire. I thank you. I bless you today. That even with our giving today, we'll be violent, we'll cause a star, and make the kingdom of the devil lose, because we will win. In Jesus' name, and everyone shouted. Come on, let's clap for Jesus violently. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Papa, for the message. In Jesus' mighty name, we're blessed. Glory to God. Yeah, we're going to give in the house of God. And let's be violent givers this morning. Praise the Lord. Take it upon you to do what the word has told us. Because therein is the blessing. So the envelopes are, are with you. Put in your offering and tithe. The children's food. And also for high flyer. And don't forget the crusade that is coming in August. Please make sure you violently give to all the church projects in Jesus' mighty name. As Papa told us, we are coming to the end of the combat month. And if you've not been fasting, it's not yet too late. You can join. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You can join in and let us pray violently in Jesus' mighty name. Praise God. Can we rise up on our feet and give in the house of God right now? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to pray. Let's rise up on our feet and we pray for our offering. Those of you that are watching us online, you can use those merchant codes to participate into giving and the Lord shall bless you. Even when you're here and you have the money on your phone, you can use the codes on the screen to give. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every man that has given in, we pray for a blessing in Jesus' mighty name. Increase them, multiply them, open doors for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us give. Those of you that have come for our third service, you're welcome. You give in into the third service. So the people that are in for the second, please give. And as you give, allow me to share the grace with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for coming. We love you. See you in the week. Our lunch hours are going, still going on. High Flyer is still on. And we are still praying and fasting till come Sunday. Hallelujah. Make sure when you go, you don't forget to pray violently. Glory to God. God bless you. God increase you. God shower you with his blessing. All for his glory.
Alléluia. If you are here for the sad service, we are beginning shortly. In Jesus' mighty name.